Welcome to Indiana Sports Beat Radio, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Know your role and shut your mouth, you jabroni! Fires upfield into the end zone, and it's caught! Jelani Woods! Touchdown! I-N-D-Y! A 43-point night for Tyrese Halliburton! How do you like that, buddy? Galloway drives all the way to the hole, throws it up, got it! And Indiana's got their first lead of this contest. It's pretty simple, I win. Google me. Now, here's your host, Jim Coyle. Hello, you beautiful, wacky people. Thanks a lot for being with us here on this Tuesday, February 6th. Jim Coyle with you as always. Another edition of Indiana Sports Beat Radio. Appreciate everybody jumping on the Andy Moore Honda hotline. Unfortunately, Matt, no. Uh, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately. Um, you do not. Uh, but uh, appreciate you being on. We uh, I have, don't remember seeing your name on there before, but uh, glad to have you. And uh, he's talking about Mike Woodson, I think, for Indiana. And unfortunately, uh, that is not going to change. Uh, if, if that is what expectations are, I, I would tell you that uh, – your that will be the same coach you'll have next year. I, I do not expect any change. Uh, Indiana could lose every game. Um, go class of 88. Bill, Buffalo Bill, my man, our longest termed listener, uh, without question. Bill has been listening to the program since we started out and we're on one, one radio station way back in the day. Uh, so thanks a lot, Bill. Appreciate you. Everybody else as well. Las Vegas, Larry, Fred, Doug, Sean, John, shenanigans, Mike shenanigans, uh, in Southern Wabash County. Plenty to get to today. A great, uh, lineup. Mike DeCourcy will join us. So we've got plenty of college basketball to talk about. Todd Leary will also join us to preview tonight's Indiana Ohio state game. Indiana hitting the road to play a team that is in basically the same position they are. Um, Chris Holtman is is getting the same treatment from the fans that Mike Woodson is getting right now. They're not happy. He has not done much at Ohio State. Um, I, I'm telling you, man, this, this era of the – the portal and NIL, it's hit certain teams. And you can tell Ohio State is one of those. Ohio State should be a, a program that does great because of the money they make. Um, they should not have a problem. But I'm guessing their NIL is all generated, is all geared toward football. Which I understand that it's probably hard to uh, grow a basketball program, but other of the guys have done it. Thad Mata had a lot of success on the sidelines there. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Ohio State fans are wishing they had Thad Mata back. And what would what? A, and speaking of the devil, with the success that he is having at Butler. How shocking would it be to see Ohio State rehire Thad Mata? You want to talk about some a coaching oddity? How uh, ironic would that be? Um, uh, kind of wild. Don't always see that very often. Sean uh, hitting us up on the Andy Moore Honda hotline says he's concerned that if Woodson lands queen, which he expects is a long shot, I would fully expect Woodson to run renew and queen together for another year of outdated offense. Well, I can't uh, say I argue with you there. Um, well, yeah, Thad, um, there was uh that, had the possibility of happening, uh, Thad to IU. That's, you know, that's a name that I hadn't thought about. If in a year from now, in, in you know, if, if, this is a big if, if in a year from now that Indiana is not 
improved, that things are not going well, that things are like they are right now. And the rumblings are much, much worse than they are. And it looks evident that they are looking for a head coach. That Mata is a name that I hadn't thought about of being in the field, but probably should be. Uh, now that that comes to mind, look at what he's done at Butler. He, he, he has turned them around and it's not easy to do that at schools like that anymore. So that's one of the biggest issues for IU fans. And I understand it's not that difficult. And it's easy for me to say sitting here because I don't have to do it. And I get that, but it's not as it's not nearly as difficult to turn programs around as it was five years ago. And so for all the fans that are saying, Oh, God, wait a minute. He's only in his third year. Yeah. That's an argument that does not does not uh, hold water for me. Your, your third year should not be a gigantic plunge. And that's what is going on. And I, I think there are several, several reasons for that. But... It is what it is for Indiana fans, unfortunately, as they have to suffer through yet another season of not making the tournament uh, after squeaking in two years ago and then getting in and winning one game last year before they got booted by a team that just outplayed them. So how much success has Indiana really had? You're comparing it to what to what happened while little Rhodey was here, and that's man, that's it doesn't take much to improve upon that. That's like me taking the uh, IQ test and then sending in Ken Jennings from Jeopardy to take it. There'll be a big difference. Then I'll bump. John Boy, how how are things going for you? You ready for the Super Bowl? You know, oh, am, I, am I allowed to say that or do I have to say the big game? I feel like in advertisements is where it's more restricted. I think we can casually talk about it as the Super Bowl. Maybe I'm wrong. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? They're going to shut down the ISB media network, whatever you want to call it. They might. I, I mean, it is the freaking <laughs> Super Bowl, man. Uh, how do you talk about the Super Bowl, not talk about the Super Bowl? Uh, it's like saying, uh, the college basketball players are playing in this tournament, but we can't call it the NCAA men's championship. Yeah. It, it's interesting how the naming rights of it, I guess, if that's, if that's what it's called, um, works. It's very confusing and, and who's allowed to say what, but I'm, I'm excited. Uh, the matchup isn't as sexy, I guess, as you would maybe hope. It's two teams that we've saw that we saw playing the Super Bowl a few years ago in 2020, right before COVID, as I might say. Uh, what um, what would be sexy? That's a good question. I, t I, I guess maybe sexy isn't the right word to use, at least the word I was looking for. I would have much preferred to see somebody who, you know, it just has a better story, like the Lions. Uh, never been to a Super Bowl. That would have been something to see with them playing. The now, I will say this. The one storyline that I am, I guess, happy to see is Brock Purdy, somebody who was the last pick in See, the NFL I was going draft. to say that's part of it not being sexy probably is because it's a guy that is not named Mahomes or Brady yep. or you know whatever you've got Mahomes on it's the other side. It's almost like you course. have David versus Goliath when you when you look at the fact that it's somebody who was very had very low expectations coming into the NFL versus somebody who is trying to follow in the footsteps of Tom Brady, people are saying. I mean, this will be and, if but not Patrick only Mahomes that, wins. Yeah, um, go ahead. So th it'll be his third Super Bowl ring. And how old is he? He's he's not even in his 30s yet. I mean, I, I don't know how close he is to his 30s. Well, I, I could be wrong about that. I don't want to say that and be incorrect. Nah, how, you're Patrick close Mahomes. enough. It's but let's let's forget about the Tom he's 28, Brady talk. 28. It ain't it ain't happening. 
That, that's why, why not can it happen? Why can't it happen? And, and not that well, I'm rooting for. I'm not. I don't really like the, the whole dynasty. He is with the right coach. I will tell you that he's with the right coach to make it happen. Andy Reid is a coach that I think could do that and will do that long term because he he's got his his junk together. Um, yeah. and where and, and it works it, between him and Mahomes. It works, and if it's if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And there's ain't broke. They just need to every season. They're going to have to add some parts here and there. That's exactly what New England did. You know, you, you you'd see some just some different pieces here and there, but it, it wasn't broke. And everybody says, "Oh, it was all Tom Brady." Well, I don't I don't believe that. I don't think that one could have done it without the other. Um. Yeah. And I think that's probably the case here. So, what about uh, Usher doing the halftime show? You like any, yeah. any of Usher's music? Yeah, it's all right. I, I, it's he's a big time star. I get that, but that's. I mean, it's all right. It's not. I, I think I, it's I'm like I'm I just, think it's eh. a great I'm artist like, eh. to. I think it's a great artist to bridge kind of the gap between the older and younger generations because it's not somebody who is way too young i guess if that's the best way to say it, it's probably not but it's somebody that i feel like everybody knows he's been around long enough that he has hits from the past but knowing him and really wanting to hear him i'll, I'll be honest with you i'd rather hear acdc go off for well that's for your generation that's your generation and, and maybe has acdc ever done generation. the super bowl i don't think acdc's ever done the super bowl have they no they maybe they will oh, uh, you never know. oh no, no no wait a minute did they way back no, no, they haven't, and there was talk of going back to that. And but look at if you look at things like Sirius XM, there's no Justin Bieber channel. There's no. <laughs> I mean, is there? I don't. I wouldn't know. But I'm, there's no sure? channel. Today's music does not have the staying power. Why do you I've think heard you say that before? Here. It's and how, true. How is there any way to know that until time passes? Well. You can't compare it to like 50 years ago. I get that. But the Stones, the Beatles, uh, there, there's just so many groups. The music of the 70s, 80s, Van Halen, uh, yeah. I just ACDC, Springsteen. Uh, it's just that stuff is just it will never stop being. Yeah, popular. I, I, don't, I don't disagree, but I. I do disagree with the fact that I think down the line, I mean, these artists, I mean, you may not like them and I don't necessarily like them either, but they have their fans who are going to grow up 20, 30 years from now. And they're going to look back on these songs and feel the same way. That, that's how music works. And real quick, uh, that's while we're talking about music. I, that's why I disagree because I don't, yeah, that's the point that I'm saying. I don't. I don't think that it will be. But Caleb's Real looking quick, forward though, to it. Before we uh, get to our first break and bring in Mike DeCourcy, I want to say rest in peace to country singer Toby Keith. Who? Oh, I'm glad you brought that up last night. Uh, man, I can't believe that. Um, I know that's shocking. Uh, I loved his music um, and did not know that uh, he was sick. He was bad. I read somewhere that he was, it was two years ago. He was diagnosed with cancer and he's been battling it with it ever since. And obviously there wasn't anything public about it until I guess today, since, since they announced that he passed away. So rest in peace to him. Last night I was at a restaurant with my wife, actually. I told you just before the show, Jim. And the, the last song we heard in the restaurant before we walked out was Toby Keith's song called my list and probably my favorite song. And looking back on that just 12 or so hours ago, thinking about, I mean, didn't even know that he was dying. It's interesting to, to have heard that, I guess, as, as it was happening. So. Uh, I like, uh, I love this bar. The, the great one. It's a great one too. And uh, is that the same one where he talks about, I mean, not, I'm not as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. Yeah. It's called as good as I once was. That's the name of it. There song. you go. There you go. So those those were two of my favorites. So there, you got that. Right. Uh, we've got to take a break. Mike DeCourcy from the Sporting News and the Big Ten Network joins us next. We'll talk about the world of Big Ten basketball and much more 
after this, brought to you by Hoosier Hanks East, located over off of College Mall Road in Bloomington, and site of After the Game with Todd Leary. And uh, I will be there tonight, as a matter of fact, for Indiana's game against Ohio State. That starts at 7. Post-game show will be uh, shortly thereafter. Hopefully it's not another uh, complaint fest, but we'll manage to do it no matter what. And we'll be back with more here after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. In the market. How do you like me now? I wish I could play Toby Keith, but the whole damn show will get taken down if I do that. <laughs> How do you like me now? How do you like me now? Now that I'm on my way. All right, I will, I'll stop doing that. I'm sure the listeners don't like that. <laughs> I actually have a funny story about Toby Keith. Oh, wait till Mike gets on. You still think I'm crazy standing here today. Good morning, Mike. Hey, John. How you doing? Doing well. Doing well. He's singing, so I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> we just, we just uh, for break, talked about the... Uh, or talk about and Toby Keith passing away. Yeah. One bad singer. <laughs> Michael, how are you, sir? I am good, Jim. How are you? I am just doing peachy. Uh, let's see. Oh man, you should have done an exclusive with uh, Taylor Swift for the Super Bowl. You probably hey, could have swung. Contacts. I was gonna say you probably could have swung that. <laughs> you're 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 that big. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Coffee almost went down the wrong pipe. <laughs> what is, uh, what's what, what's your latest piece that you have out? Last thing I wrote was about uh, the um, Boston College coach going to the NFL and how everybody's like, oh, woe is me, college athletics, terrible. <laughs> what the Boston, hell does that have to do? What, what, how is that any new? Because I mean, Boston that's College's coach supposedly said it's so untenable to be a coach at Boston College because you used to be able to Here we go, guys. Five Kansas seconds. Kansas Five seconds. And Fish House, no matter where you live. This segment is brought to you by The Chop Shop, home of the Indiana football and men's basketball coaches shows. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Welcome back. Indiana Sports Beat Radio, Jim Coyle with you as always on this Tuesday, February 6th. Joined now by the great Mike DeCourcy from Sporting News and the Big Ten Network. Mike, how are you, brother? I am well, Jim. How are you? Great. Uh, your Steelers did not lose this week, so there's got to be that. In honor of Super Bowl week, though, we're, we're representing. You're, uh, are you attending? No. No, no. I've got... Uh... I've got Big Ten basketball and beyond. That's on. right. That's right. I forgot. I forgot. Now that's got to be uh That's got to maybe put a little dent in your audience on Sunday. A little bit, but I, I I can't remember what time what time we first aired this week. I, I don't know exactly 
when our first air we we actually may have a first airing before the Super Bowl kicks off, possibly, maybe, not sure. I have to look that up. Well, we'll certainly look forward to that. Uh, Indiana takes on Ohio State tonight in a game in which uh, we'll see which fan bases are more upset. Uh, after this game, because uh, both of them are neither of them are happy. Both uh, are are, are uh, calling for coaches and and that Dartmouth. The ruling that came down for the Dartmouth players. What is that going to do? Is, is we've had it somewhat before, but it, and it failed for the Northwestern football players. It died in court. This is I, I another say- effort. I don't know what the I don't know what the outcome is going to be because we don't know where it ends up in court. But I, it's the most preposterous thing I've ever seen in my life in in forty some years of covering college athletics. Uh, Jim, do you know how many people attend the average Dartmouth men's basketball home game? At twelve hundred. Not even that. Six hundred and ninety three. There are probably there are probably. Now I haven't been a, I haven't been to a ton of high school basketball games lately, so I don't know how the audiences are holding up over the years from when I used to cover it. No, I will say this: when I covered high school basketball in the '80s, I almost never attended a game, covered a game that had that few people at it. Almost never. My high school, my high school got double that. Uh, I, I, my, I, my high school wasn't even any good at basketball. Got did, did more than that. Um, and actually and, they got four times that and you, you know, you go places like, uh, Newcastle and other uh, Browns, uh, Brownsburg here. I mean, Seymour everywhere you, know, you want to go. So, so does this mean that high school basketball players are employees now? I mean, if, if, if a, if a, if a program that draws 600 is there, that they are employees, then my goodness, what are high school athletes? It, it's a, it's a, it's a, the, there is no logic to what was to what was no, legal or otherwise. I'm not a lawyer, but I know there's no logic to declaring them employees. It's it's preposterous. If you want to make the case that the football players are, at Alabama are employees by by you know de facto employees, I'll listen. But that's the problem with this concept is that there there's a line. And I don't know where to draw it, but I know that Dartmouth is not on the employee side of it at all. They're just on the they're just on the smart side. Well, they didn't have anything else to do because they're out there going one and fifteen. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I I have to presume that's what 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 this was about because like uh, they clearly aren't putting much into winning basketball games and not able to cash in on nil. Uh, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know whether they are or not. I mean, I will say this. I I, I met a Columbia football player who was an intern at a uh, television show I was on <laughs> a summer or two ago, and he had NIL. He was an intern there, and 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 he had he he was telling me about. He didn't tell me what the dollar figures were or anything, but he had an he had a name, image, and likeness deal, uh, or maybe more than one. So it's not that they're excluded from that, but to to present themselves as de facto employees when they generate almost no revenue. And and, and some of the things that I read about media coverage and this and that, how how many Ivy League games do you see on television? Let alone at games involving Dartmouth, but like as good as the basketball might be between Yale and Princeton, how much do you see it on television? It's not on ESPN, it's not on Fox. Is it, it maybe it's on it at one of the the regionals up there, Nesson or something? I don't know. I've never seen it. Um, I, I do know that when they get down to their uh, their championship uh, that they that they conceived a few years ago, that that gets on like it. But I I I, I don't see Ivy League basketball on television. If, if it's there, they don't do a very good job of promoting it because I like I said, I mean I'm a pretty basketball savvy and and engaged person and other than that championship game when it comes up i've not seen regular season ivy league basketball on television i i uh if they're going to do that then i i think for one thing the first thing you do is you turn around and you start charging for the scholarships the scholarships are no longer free you, you have to pay to go to school here if you want to be an employee here and 
play basketball? Well, that's you have to pay to be to to do that. But Dartmouth is a different deal, though, there because they don't have athletic scholarships. Uh, So I don't know. I I know that a lot of their uh, then you just have to pay straight out. I know they're going to come here. A lot of their athletes get aid and that sort of thing, but they're not getting athletic scholarships like they are in every other Division One school. Why the Ivy does that? You know, they're the Ivy League. They do what they do, but. I just there's there's no logic to presenting them as employees at all and, and, and under any circumstance. Uh, it, they 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 said the 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 ruling said something like, if I remember it right, that other other um, other. That's very funny by Fred saying that, Sam that, Gilbert was the originator of NIL. Yes, I, gotta, I gotta stop to acknowledge that that, that was great. Um, uh, the the. Uh, the, the, they, they, they differentiated between other activities as, you know, relative to employees. And again, like if you're in the Yale drama school, say, and they put on a production of, let's say, a fellow or something like I'm not walking in there for free. I got to get a ticket. So how are how are they not employees? Then how are the 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 acting students in in the Yale drama school that are putting on a fellow not employees of the university just as the basketball players it's just like i said that line is hard to draw and i know that the nlrb totally botched it yeah and the worry is that college sports has already been really damaged to me the 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 concept of it and it can only get worse if things like this continue to happen and at some point it's going to fall on its face uh, there, there, there has to come a tipping point at some, at some point, not for all schools, but it will really change which the dynamic has already been changed. Um, these, so a lot of these schools that are, that are, there are schools that just have not handled the portal, uh, NIL era and it is showing up and their programs are not. But that's okay, Jim. Somebody's going to lose. You right, gotta, right. Somebody's going to lose games. I don't care that let a particular school is having trouble co- co- uh, coming up with enough NIL. Too bad. Uh, that's, you know, that's too bad. I don't care about that. Here's what I care about, Jim. I care about the athlete and the student athlete or whatever you want to call it, uh, that person uh, or persons. I care about whether or not their experience is as positive in the future as it was in the past. And I can tell you, that there is a, you know, you talk about the dividing line. Like, do you remember when you got out of college? Like that dividing line between I'm just a student and I got my life to I'm a working person. And now I'm at the whim of, uh, of the per- people I'm working for is a pretty big line. And most college students aren't in that big a hurry to get from one side of the line to the other because they know it's coming. And once they get to that side of the line, Jim, it's 40 some years minimum before you, you know, before you, uh, you can get back to uh, whatever. And you may or may not want to get back to whatever, like uh, Nick Saban took another six or seven years past 65, but it, it's a long period of your life. So what's the rush to become an employee? I will say this, if I am Dartmouth and I now have 13 or 14 employees in men's basketball, and they're one in whatever in the league. You're why fired. Would I, why would I keep them? They're terrible. You're fired. You're why fired. Would, they're terrible. Why would I got to be able to do better than that? Yeah. I can't do any worse. I guess it could be 0 and 12 or what, rather than 1 and 11. But that's if terrible. These, and if these guys are employees, how is it any different for high school athletes that's who also saying. play varsity basketball or whatever the sport is? Uh, you're doing the same thing. It's just, it's it's just on a much smaller scale, is all. But there's not no a smaller difference. scale than the Ivy League, Jim. Or, or, oh I, no, I, no, I, no. I shouldn't, say that. I shouldn't say it. It's not a smaller scale than Dartmouth basketball. Right. It, it may be smaller than uh, uh, Princeton basketball. I haven't been to a Princeton home game, but I went to a Dartmouth football game. Um, probably '97. I went to a Dartmouth football game. My wife and I were. Uh, in New Hampshire for our anniversary, and I wanted to go to uh, I wanted to go to a football game, so we went to the game. And I'm telling you that almost every high school game I've ever attended, and again, not at 
like Texas powers, but like uh, Western Pennsylvania, my high school, or some of uh, some of the high schools I covered back in the day. I never went to a high school football game, and this I can say unequivocally, never that had as small a crowd as that Dartmouth football game. And, and now I know that was 25 years ago or 15 or whatever, um, but still, like that's this. We're not talking about Alabama. It's it's not even in the same conversation as Alabama. So the idea that they are de facto employees based on the fact that other schools are selling television rights at a high level or selling out 100,000 seat stadiums, that doesn't add up. I mean, if, if that's like trying to equate somebody who writes, you know, a pamphlet with the person with Leo Tolstoy who wrote War and Peace. I mean, they're just not the same things. Is it NIL a, a way for colleges now to avoid this scenario? I, I, that's what I've been saying, Jim. This is the sweet spot. Once you get to full-time employer, employee, okay, transfer portal is not a thing anymore. Uh, it, it gets it gets taken down uh, to a much smaller scale um, uh, because that once you have employer, employee, then you have collective bargaining agreements. Uh, and so there, the, your move you would have contracts or some something similar to that. So this is the sweet spot for the athlete, uh, and it's not a bad spot for the colleges because again, the money doesn't come out of their athletic departments. It some of it doesn't go into their athletic departments in the way that it did before because it might have been donations uh, to the athletic department. But it, 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 I I really truly believe this is the sweet spot, and and what 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 happens is. College coaches never see the sweet spot. They didn't see the sweet spot 10 years ago when they when NIL wasn't even a thing. And they don't see it now because of the transfer portal making their jobs more difficult. But the, the football coach at Boston College left his job a few weeks after doing a podcast interview complaining about the nature of college football as it is now and how they that before long, you're going to have only a few schools that can compete. And I'm like, like, did he sleep through the last decade? Yeah. We had five schools in the in the 10 in the 14 CFP area. Five schools got 65% of the bids to the college football playoff. Five schools: Alabama, Georgia, Oklahoma, Ohio State, Clemson. Five schools got 65% of the bids. And of the Power Five athletic programs that existed during that period, 72% never saw the inside of the playoff. And that includes big time schools like Southern Cal, Texas A&M, Penn State, uh, schools that had great football histories, in some cases, championship football histories, in some cases, recent championship football histories. USC was only 2005. And they didn't and, and they didn't get a playoff bid the entire time of the four team. Now we'll have a 12 team playoff. And maybe those five schools that I talked about are the ones that ascend to the semifinals and finals every year. Maybe. But I think that it, just by nature of the competition, it's got to be more wide open than it was. Uh, there's there's no way that this is a going to be a worse era for competition. Absolutely no way than what we just went through. And he's complaining about what we just went about, what the future is and not what we just went through. Uh, I, I wish him all the best going to green Bay uh, to be defensive coordinator. But the idea that Boston college was ever going to be one of those schools anyway is preposterous. They have not been, they, they, they have not been relevant since Doug Flutie was there in 1990, excuse me, in 1984. Not they were only relevant and truly for those 15 seconds. <laughs> they had, they have had four times in their history, in their entire college football history, 100 plus years, four times where they won double digit games. So we're supposed to worry about the fact that BC's coach doesn't think he can compete for championships. You, you're at BC playing football. If you're, if you want to be at BC and play, compete for championships, you should coach hockey. No kidding. Hey, Mike DeCourcy from the Sporting News is with us. We've got Big Ten basketball to talk about as well. We'll do that when we come back. Brought to you by the Chop Shop here in Bloomington, where each and every Monday night at 7.05, you can find Don Fisher 
and uh, Mike Whitson for Inside Indiana Men's Basketball. Back with more with Mike DeCourcy right after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. If you're looking for a home. Mike, which fan base comes at you the most whenever they whenever they think you've misseated them in the in your brackets? John, it is it, there is no one that uh, is any less or more um, guilty than another. <laughs> it's funny because the very first bracket I ever did. So this is all the way back in nineteen uh, excuse me in uh, 2019, 20, Very first bracket I ever did. It was after Butler had a really nice non conference run and. They were ranked, I don't know, fifth or something. And I had them as a three seed. Um, and they and they were ripping me saying I hate Butler. And and I'm like, it's the closest division one school to my house. Like, why would I hate it? <laughs> We've got uh the course he's dozen. I have, I, 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 I mean, I, as, as a journalist, I don't, but a little bit in my heart, I, I hate to say that I agree with your number one pick. <laughs> I, I don't want to get too far into it until we come back, but this, this, this could be the year. Mm, could be. I f- I feel like people said I mean, that last year, but well, I mean, but and, and, and that's and that's true, but they're better. And as the uh, song goes, Kenny Loggins said it best: "This is it. <laughs> Make no mistake where you are. This is it. You're going no further well, if that's you don't the thing. win. They're going no further. See, they're going. If you don't, could you win, imagine if last year? Could no you imagine further. they became the first team to lose to two 16 seeds? Oh, it's not. Oh gonna... my. Did yeah, you think? Happen, I, but... Actually, this might be a really stupid question, but I mean, Matt Painter wouldn't lose his job if that happened, would he? That's, a, that's probably a really stupid no, question. No. But no. boy, they would be really, really, really. Boy, they'd be. They'd have the red eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. Uh, yeah, I don't see it much where that happens. Lance Jones is not letting that happen this time. He's no he's the difference maker right there. Braden <clears throat> Braden Smith is is a you know is a much more. He was very good last year. Don't get me wrong, but he's so much more confident now, and he was really confident and good last year. But he's just a flat out baller now. I mean, that's it's not going to happen. All right, here we go, guys. 0.9% APR financing for 36 months on a 2023 Honda Ridge line. Go to AndyMoreHonda.com and get more to your door. This segment is brought to you by Remax Advanced Realty, Indie Home Pros team by Cheryl Sizemore. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Welcome back. It is Tuesday. Thanks a lot for being with us here at Indiana Sports Beat Radio. Jim Coyle with you as always. Mike DeCourcy joining me from the Big Ten Network and Sporting the Sporting News. And if you go to the Sporting News, you can find DeCourcy's dozen. And um, at the top, he has the Purdue Boilermakers, and I cannot disagree with him. Uh, Purdue it just seems like the most complete team right now because they have the immovable immovable object in Mount Edie who I don't care what you do he's going to get 18 and 13 and that's if you're that's if you're hanging on him um and then he is they've added they did the one thing I, I hate to point fingers but you look at Indiana they knew what they needed to add desperately well there was a number of things but guard the guard spot was absolutely one of those. They didn't do it, and it has just continued to claw at them this year. Matt Painter adds one guy to his roster, one guy, the guy he needed, 
And Lance Jones has been a difference maker. Not, and it's just he has seamlessly fit in with Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer and and, and Mount Edie, and not only fit in, but he's a he's a high point. He's been fantastic, and you know it's it's funny. I was talking to Rafael Davis, my uh, one of my two partners on Big Ten, uh, two analyst partners. Uh, Rick Pizzo, our host, is great. Uh, and then the two analyst partners, John Beeline, the great coach at Michigan, and uh, and Rafael Davis. And Rafael and I were talking about Purdue and its chances in March. And and I one of the things that I speculated about was a worry about their ability to make threes when people sagged off to to guard Edie. And I know that statistically they are one of the leading three point shooting teams in the country, but some of that gets built up by how you do against uh, the lesser opposition. How, what, what, what happens when you play the best teams? Now I know Fletcher lawyer had a great game against Arizona, but he hasn't been as productive lately. And uh, so statistically there are some high points in their three point shooting, but I looked at Lance and, and I just, I, I said, do you think that there's enough? And he said, Lance is the difference. And I said, but he's only shooting, like at that point, I think on the season, he was shooting in the 35 range. And and Rafael said, it's different now. So I looked it up uh, in advance of this past weekend's games. We had the big game against Wisconsin uh, coming up. And we, so we talked about it on the big show on Saturday. Lance Jones is now shooting 39.5% from three-point range since Big Ten play resumed in January. So the competition on the regular, every game, Big Ten level, high stakes, full, full, full crowds, teams, you know, going after Zach, trying to figure out a way to stop him. And he's out dropping threes at almost a 40% clip. And that's what you need. You need guys that can do that. I And, and he does not shy away from any shot. I, I sometimes worry a little bit about a particular shot, but it's not a persistent problem. Uh, I think that he's made a huge difference. And and defensively, he was terrific on Sunday uh, against A.J. Storr. He did a fantastic job making Storr's life difficult uh, in, in what was a home game for Wisconsin. And Storr's one of the best wings in the league, and Lance locked him up. I mean, he got off shots, but they were they were not – the best shots on average. And I think he went something like six of 14 from the field, if I remember right. And, and, and a lot of that was, you know, most of it was Lance. He, is he playing the three? Essentially. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's somebody like in the, uh, in the world where we still have a Julius Irving award, uh, uh, it, there, he, there has to be a technically a small forward, I guess, but, that's what he. That's what he would be, and and you know he was guarding the three, uh, AJ Store, who is a, definitively a small forward uh, at the college level. Uh, he was guarding him, and he did a fantastic job. Yeah, because that gives them three point threats uh, at three th- at three different positions. Well, right. probably four, but well, when they put just, when they play Mason Gillis, they have four. Uh, when they play but, uh, Trey Kaufman Wren, they do not. But Trey gives them. Uh, great rebounding and 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 somebody that to you know maybe can physically at times take bodies off of off of Zach. Although that's that's not as um, he's he's not he he can do it physically, but uh, he has to gain the attention of the defenders, and they're mostly worried about Zach, about Zach. Yeah, uh, without question, that 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 three headed monster, if it's rolling, and you've got Mount Mount Edie there. Uh, it's like wave the white towel. I don't know what you do. I mean, you're going to have to, if they have it rolling, that's the thing. They have to do this for six games. Yes. And that's what they've not been able to do is find consistency for multiple games in a row. I mean, they've done it in the big 10, but you have to do it when it's the NCAA tournament. Oh man, it's different because Woo, it's like rolling the dice. Who do we have this week, and what kind of style are we going against? Right. What are they going to do? What are they going? What 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 are they going to present? The different challenges, and, and that has been the, because the other because they get ahead of so many teams, 
And this is the one thing that where Purdue has not made great progress is they do not handle pressure well. Uh, that's still a problem for them. Uh, inbounding the basketball against pressure. You saw it on Sunday when Wisconsin was trying to scramble back because the game was nearly over and they needed as many possessions as possible. The, Purdue got itself into some trouble there. And that's something that they have to get better at because they're going to get ahead of somebody. And I, I take you back to 2016 uh, when, when Syracuse played against Gonzaga and Virginia in Chicago in what I guess was the Midwest region. And, and Gonzaga kicked the heck out of Syracuse for like 32 minutes. And so Syracuse just turned on a full court press, a scramble press. They're not a pressing team, but it's winner, winner go home. So they put on a scramble press and they turned over Gonzaga enough and they won the game. They weren't a better team. They weren't one of the four best teams in America, but they put on a scramble press and they beat Gonzaga. Now they're in the Elite Eight. Virginia's kicking their tails for 32 minutes. Same thing. Put on a scramble press. Virginia succumbs to that. And instead of making the Final Four in 2016 for the first time, Tony Bennett has to wait to 19 and that particular Purdue miracle. Uh, and so that that's and so Syracuse gets back to the Final Four, not because they were one of the four best teams and not because of the zone being vexing as it often was for their opposition, but just because they were desperate and their opposition didn't handle it. And that's something that Purdue, I think, between now and March has to get better at. Uh, they, have to, they have to become proficient at advancing the basketball against a desperate team. Uh, as far as the Big Ten goes, you've got Wisconsin who, boy, the, the game against Purdue, speaking of the devil, that was uh, – that was a gigantic step for Purdue in winning the conference because that was a hurdle they had to get over. They have one more hurdle, in my opinion, that's at Illinois, and boom, and then that's done. But man, that game, if that game goes the other way, uh, we're at Purdue's in a different situation in the conference race, which it doesn't change their doesn't change their uh, their prognostications for the NCAA, but it would have just changed that for the, the, the conference, which I, I don't think they would not have been happy with that, but they have the bigger prize in mind. Uh, there's no question. How much pressure is on the Boilers to, to not just to, to not lose in the first round, but how much pressure is on Matt Painter to get to the final four? Because like I said, this is it, baby. You, this is the last year you're going to have, the two-time college basketball player of the year. And I know he's got another seven-footer in the wings, but I don't care. It is not Mount Edie. Mount Edie was the, has been the college player of the year, will be for two years. That does not happen very often. It, and there's a reason for that. It's hard to accomplish. Um, and so he has – I'm not going to say he's got the best team because it, that 2016 team was pretty good. Jaden Ivey – uh, they got close, but they, this is it, man. Well, I, you know, I think the pressure for, for someone like Matt, um, I'm, he, he's, he's making a very, 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 very comfortable living. So there's not pressure from that standpoint. He'll be fine. Um, if, if, if someone said, okay, we didn't, and this is not going to happen. Produce knows what they're doing. But if, so, if someone said, we, you know, we can't get to the final four, so we should make a change, uh, he's still going to he'd get another job in 13 seconds. He's one of the half dozen to dozen best coaches in college basketball. So there's no pressure from that standpoint. The pressure is, and is that th this is the opportunity. This is the one. I, I remember when I covered the Cincinnati Bearcats in 2000. I mean, Bob Huggins had – made the final four at that point. He'd made the elite eight twice, I believe, in addition to that. And, and then it had, while I was covering him, three consecutive second round losses. And with teams that were all seated either second or third. And so that, that, that 2000 team, that was like the moment they knew that, that Kenyon Martin playing at a level uh, that very few college players have reached. And they had, they surrounded him with multiple guys who were going to the NBA. And so it was, it, and, it, and they had great chemistry for the most part. They were having 
problem with one player, but I think they had resolved that. And so, and then ultimately it got ruined by Kenyon Martin's injury in the conference tournament, but that they knew that was, it wasn't about external pressure. It was about internal pressure that this is the opportunity. This is your chance. And this is the only, in college sports, this is the only chance you get because your team's going to be entirely reconstituted from year to year in almost every circumstance, in pretty much every circumstance. I mean, name it inch like this and the transfer portal didn't change that even if you had the same guys, you had a different team. That's That's been reality in college sports for a hundred years. Even if you had all the same, the same five players in your starting lineup or the same eight players in your rotation, everything was different because players have different priorities after they, after they go through a year, they may, uh, they may start thinking about the pros or they might start thinking about, I think I want a more prominent role or more of the ball or whatever. So it's always changed. Uh, but now, but it's different when you, when the roster is going to change uh, because that's when the pressure really amps up because you know, this is the only shot you get with this group. You're going to have back uh, Fletcher lawyer and Braden Smith and miles Colvin uh, and Cam Heidi, and you're going to have a lot of really good players on next year's team, uh, but you're not going to have this group. You're not going to have Zach Eady again, almost certainly. I believe he's eligible if he wants it, but with people talking about him now getting drafted in the lottery, there, there's no reason to take that risk by coming back again. You, oh, I didn't realize he had another year. Doesn't he have the COVID year? This is his fourth year. Yeah, I, I wasn't. Uh, he's yeah, a, so I, I he's believe like, that's correct. He's not. He's not in a COVID year. Uh, he is in his fourth year of college basketball, and he was on the Boilers in 2019, 2020, 21, Excuse me. So this is his fourth season, and so he has another year if he wants it. But uh, Jonathan Gavoni from ESPN projecting him into the first round, into the lottery of the first round, tells me he's wow. the first pick now. Or you were, That's yeah, that a, happened about two, three weeks ago. And John is not like, he's not going to like throw that out there. He's, he, he, he he's, has a very good eye for talent. Uh, he's been doing it for over 20 years, but he also is very connected. And so somebody in the league said, yeah, it's going to happen. Like, like as long as they, Zach stays healthy, he's going to, it's going to happen somewhere in the first round for him. And, um, so that Thought, so he he'll 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 almost certainly take that. Quick question uh, on Caitlin Clark: If she were to stay, she would obliterate uh, virtually every record there is, which I would find repulsive because uh, of it being an added year. Just like I I was not happy, and I like Mike Davis; he's very kind to us. He comes on the show, but I was not at all supportive of their effort to try to buy their way into that CBI tournament. Oh, no, no, not at all. I, I was all, and I, I didn't have I, a problem That was just with... aggravating. I mean, you've got record. I, I, this is a record that is one of the most beloved in sports set by a guy who could only do it in three years and right. did not have a three point shot. Yeah. I didn't have a huge problem with them pursuing it for the fifth year because it was the nature of the competition at the time, because he had already gotten one more year than pistol got, but the CBI thing I was totally opposed to. Like if you get it within the confines of your season, if you're able to stretch it out by getting to the conference championship game or getting to the NCAAs or whatever, I was fully in support of that. First of all, I, I like the kid a lot. Mike, Mike Jr. is a wonderful young man uh, to speak with. And born so, in born in Bloomington. Yeah, I, I I I remember being at Mike's house, Mike Senior's house, when when he was a baby, uh, and and seeing him in his his uh, his playpen. Uh, that's that's how far we all went back with him. But I was I, I I did not like the CBI concept at all. I, I'm glad it didn't happen. If he'd gotten it in the Youngstown game, or if they'd won the Youngstown game and they'd gone on, I think that was their. That was their quarterfinal, might have been their semi. If he'd gone on and been able to break it in the Horizon League tournament, okay, great. But you know, for Caitlin, like she doesn't need another year to break the record. She's going to break it possibly this weekend, certainly within the next two weeks. 
as long as she stays healthy and let's hope she does. Um, and so she doesn't need that. And she's going to push past it, past Kelsey Plum by a very large margin. And somebody may come along one day and break hers. D great. But I think when you're at Caitlin Clark's situation, people have said, well, all this money and name, image and likeness, uh, she'll make more money at Iowa if she, than if she comes to the fever and, and plays for them. One, State Farm isn't saying, oh, you're in the WNBA now, so you're not interesting. I, like exactly. That, it, she doesn't get there. There will probably be more opportunities, actually. Exactly. And and I think there's a time in the career of someone who's as gifted and driven as she is to go play against the best. And that time will arrive at, at the end of Iowa's season. Uh, she, she, it'd, be, it'd be awesome if she took – Iowa to back-to-back -back Final Fours, uh, maybe even took it farther than that. But I, I do think that for an athlete, you want to play against the best, especially if you are one of the best. It, it's not a question of, uh, for her, is will she make it? Like, it? like when you're a typical college prospect or a college player as a prospective pro, your question might be, can I make it? That's not a question for her. At that point, the question becomes, what can I do against the very best? Can I be one of the very best? I, I have no doubt that Caitlin Clark believes that she can come into the league and, and, and excel. Uh, she may not be the instant best player in the league. I don't think she will be. But she will come into the league and excel. And she will drive that league to the greatest popularity it's known. Uh, Mike DeCourcy, sorry about that, from the Sporting News and the Big Ten Network. Make sure you find him this weekend uh, as he will be there on Saturday and Sunday, right? I will be there Saturday and Sunday, absolutely. Uh, looking oh. forward to it. Uh, I'm uh, great working with John and, and Rafe. I learn something every week. Absolutely, and we do too. Appreciate you so much, Mike. Have a Thanks great you. day and the rest, rest of your week. Take care. Up next, Todd Leary joins us, the Todd Father. We'll talk about tonight's game, Indiana taking on an Ohio State team. Both of these teams are in similar situations uh, and are just fighting for some respectability uh, at the very least. But uh, we'll get to that and much more after this. Brought to you by REMAX Realty and Cheryl Sizemore in the market for a home in the Indianapolis area. You need Cheryl Sizemore and her two decades of experience could be the difference between getting the home you want or not. Reach out to her, Cheryl, at IndyHomePros.com. Back after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. In the market. Hello, Todd morning, Father. Todd. What's happening? <clears throat> Are you able to turn your camera sideways at all? If I do, then it looks like I'm looking. Oh, okay, that's like fine. I'm looking that's fine. The you opposite direction. Of whatever it. you're more comfortable doing. Yeah, if you don't. <clears throat> what do you mean? It looks Plus like you're looking my, in the opposite direction. My logo direction. better there. So, so if I turn it sideways, like the camera <laughs> is over on the left. You know what I mean? So when I'm looking at the, when I'm actually looking at you on the camera, I'm not looking straight ahead. It looks like I'm looking sideways. I get you. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to, I can't believe that there's not a setting to fix that on Apple, but I've tried to look it up like a thousand times and I don't think there is. Uh, pro no, I need it. I need to just get a, a, a computer that I always do these on so that it's oh! a normal computer. Speaking of which, Did you get it. Well, located, laptop located. Where was Orlando it? Airport. Oh, my. Oh, Jesus. I, I, How'd you find I it? I started thinking, I'm like, you know what? Because every airport is different now. Some don't make you take your damn laptops out. Some do make you take your laptops out. And I'm like, uh, I've been through so many airports lately. I'm like, did Orlando have me take, the, take it out? I don't remember taking it out. Uh, so I just, and it dawned on me and I'm like, so the other day I sent an email and I, and yesterday I got an email back and I'm like, yes, they found no it. No way. How do you so, get it? Uh, that's they the next question. No, Chippy pay for it, I guess. And all that, which is fine. It's better than the thousand dollars to yeah. replace the damn thing. 
No kidding. Oh, but I was like, gee whiz. Yeah, but yeah, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, because I still had the freaking charger cord. And I'm like, damn it. Yeah, it was probably just one in one of those bins and you forgot to grab it. Yep. Well, I, I, I don't remember taking it out. Um, it may have been a deal though where they run my bag through and then they took it out. Unbeknownst yeah. to me. Those dirty dogs. Dirty dogs. MyJumpShot.com, baby. Yeah, I, that's all over uh, the site now. Do you, do you remember how to access in there? No. Can you <laughs> can you send it to me? Well, let's see. Because I tried like getting into it, and it doesn't. Get, if you don't know your login stuff, it doesn't. You don't have any access to see anything. Uh, I'll, what username did you use? Do you know that? I Is it just no Todd idea. Leary? I have no Here idea. Here we go, guys. Here we go. 10 seconds. I'll just get 812-583-0919 or go to mystonecrestliving.com. That's mystonecrestliving.com for more details. This segment is brought to you by Hoosier Hanks East. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Mohana of Bloomington. Hey, hey, welcome back. Indiana Post or Indiana Sports Beat Radio. <laughs> I'm thinking about the post game show tonight. Creature already. Rabbit. <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, Jim Coyle with you as always and joined by the Todd Father. Uh, and don't forget myjumpshot.com. If you have somebody in your family uh, that you know, uh, boy, girl, younger, high school, doesn't matter and you think they can get to that next level and they need that something, fix that shot, man. Todd's sick and tired of seeing Indiana kids not shoot the ball correctly. That um, drives me nuts. <laughs> and you know what? It's funny because you see so many styles, and you've talked about Jordan Hulls before. There's a picture in the um, – it's the IU basketball record book. And I, I just happened to see it yesterday. And I'm like, oh, my God, I, I'd love to show this to Todd. But um, <laughs> look at look at the form on that. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, I don't know. You couldn't, teach, you couldn't teach that form to end. Like, he had to do that from the time he was a little kid. But, but that is actually, like, technically based on what you're taught as a child, that is technically perfect. Like, but that's not how – that's not how most people shoot. That's not how I would teach you to shoot. That's but that's it, probably because when he was uh, younger, he was someone had just someone a, had him undersized. Like the, myth, the myth of having your elbow directly underneath the ball, like that's not that's not normal. Like that's not a normal uh, motion for your arm or hand to be. Um, but but he probably had he probably was taught to shoot with one hand, which in order to balance the ball as a little kid, you've got to keep your, you know, your elbow has to be underneath there in order just to balance the ball. And that's probably how he grew up and learned. And, and it's, it's actually not really ideal, but, but it's technically perfect. And well, he hit a damn, just like yourself. Uh, he hit a, a hell of a lot of three point shots uh, with that. He hit a lot more well, I don't know if he hit a lot more, but uh, well, he 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 yeah, was able yeah, to yeah. take more. He he was yeah. on some bad teams. He, yeah, he did no, not have. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, but it's so, it's so funny. I I put this out a couple times, and I think I mentioned it somewhere again yesterday. Oh yeah, it was when I was in uh, rivals, just responding on the forums about stuff. Five out of Indiana's all time top 11 three-point shooters were on one freaking team we're on the yeah. same damn team that's 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 almost not even possible uh, and i guess yourself, that's probably part of the reason why i can't understand you know how these guys aren't like I don't, I don't see any changes like i don't see the only guy that i see a dramatic difference in his jump shot today versus two years ago is xavier and it's 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 a lot different because it was so technically wrong, um, but it's still there's some things that he could definitely do that I think he would actually be a good shooter, uh, a good consistent shooter. And but I mean it's just it it frustrates me because I don't see 
even if it's not the coaches working with these guys, I don't see the players tinkering with their shots enough to to make a difference right now. And, and that probably truly goes down to exactly why I started the website, Jim, is because I don't think I don't think they know what to work on. I don't think they know what to do to make it better. Well, how could they? I mean, yeah, and, there's and the, no. You know, the, the like like a dad right now across the state right now with your kid, just go to him and sit him down and ask him to describe his jump shot. And I'll bet you it's nowhere near what it actually looks like. I bet I bet the the things that he says he is is thinking about trying to do are not even close to what it actually is. Indiana is uh, the last I checked, 326th out of about 352 at the free throw line. Um that's another thing that I personally, I just don't, I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't know how you can be that bad. Uh, part of it is Jordan or uh, not Jordan, but uh, Peyton Sparks, you know, if he, but he has not shot a ton because yeah, he hasn't he played hasn't a shot ton. Enough of him to affect Trey that Galloway much. is his big, his major fall off is probably the, one of the biggest contributors, but he's not alone. There, even McKenzie and Baco, who started out the year hitting like 23 straight, Gee whiz! It's like every time you see him go to the line, he's hitting one out of two. Um, yeah, and I, it, I, that stuff's I, hard. I, to it's explain, like are yeah. they are they not taking? I was I was watching the Duke your your Duke game yesterday, uh, just the end of it. But I was watching the free throw shooters. They were taking their time. There was no rush, and you know everybody thinks back. You think of Steve Alford or whatever, but he had a rhythm. Uh, it, it was a every time, it, everything. It was the exact same every time. Yeah, and, and true to your point, I think if you had you timed for Steve Alford, the the actual amount of time it took from the time he first touched the ball to go through his whole routine. Actually, if you did where he started with his, you know, his ankles and his back of his, you know, wiping his hands. And if you started that whole routine and you went through and you timed it, every single free throw he shot his whole time at Indiana, I'll bet you the variation and difference is very, very, very small. I bet they're I bet they're all – you're right. He had a rhythm and it kind of stuck to – you know, it, it was kind of the same. And it, it was – he was very comfortable at the free throw line. He always felt like he was going to make it. And, you know, I, I think a lot of kids my age and, and, you know, a little bit younger than me growing up, we kind of grew up – seeing that understanding that and practicing that and i mean i dribble three times because steve alford dribbled three times like you know if i go out now today and i go shoot 100 free throws today for whatever reason like i would only dribble one time just because like there's no point in me dribbling three times anymore i don't need that routine but i'll still make 95 percent of them like it's just like it once once you're in a habit of a routine that you're comfortable with and that's that's the part where i see you know like the free throw line is the biggest glaring example uh, or, or difficulty with watching this Indiana team because everything is slowed down. You can watch them in, in slow motion. You can watch them as they get the ball and the, the process that they go through. And they're making so many technical errors just in watching what you can, the angles that you can see on TV or live in person that I can see, like I can see so many things they could do to become more consistent and it, it it just surprises me that, you know, either someone else on the team hasn't worked with these guys, each other to get them better at it, or the coaching staff or whomever haven't gotten them to the point where they work on it. But there are some things they could easily do right off the bat that would make them better free throw shooters. Well, they'll have the opportunity tonight as they uh, will travel to take on the Buckeyes of Ohio State. And both of these teams are in – uh, pretty much the same position. They're both the records are th the same. I think they're both thirteen and eight. Uh, of course, Indiana's on the road, so that makes a difference. But neither team has played really good basketball. As a matter of fact, yeah. both both fan bases are pissed off. Uh, nobody's happy. This is the unhappy game. I mean, there's nobody happy going into this game right now, which is kind of. I, it's not funny, but it is in a way. It's uh, usually there's somebody that's on a ride in a high, but man, this is the uh, the toilet bowl for, for well, the fans. I, 
Yeah, it is. And, and you know what? It's funny for a lot of fan bases that are not Ohio State and Indiana. Um, they get a chuckle out of it because these two programs, especially I'll say Indiana, have, you know, in the far past been very consistently good teams that, you know, uh, there would be a lot of uh, other teams across the Big Ten rooting for Indiana to get beat tonight on the road at Ohio State because Indiana, it would it would mean that team had a better chance of winning the Big Ten title because it would knock Indiana you know, another game in the loss column. And and that's just not the case anymore. I mean, Indiana doesn't even sniff the top of the Big Ten anymore. And so, you know, it it takes away some of the fun. We're just, um, you know, I, th- I thought about it a lot this this weekend and after the game with Penn State. And, you know, it's it's we're just in a position as Indiana fans that we're not used to being in. And and we are um, we're kind of the whipping boy. And we maybe we should be used to being in it because in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of a lot of years we have been in this position. Um, but, you know, we, we we live historically on what we were good at and why we became Indiana fans. That's why I don't think I don't think we're being that big a crybabies because we became Indiana fans because of how they played and their ability to be mentally tough and go on the road, and win games you weren't sure they were going to win. and you know, I, we're just not in that position anymore. And that's that's difficult for us to accept and frustrating for us to have to accept. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ohio State, they've lost six out of their last seven. Indiana has lost four out of their last five. So 10 out of their last 12 games between these two teams, they've lost. And, uh, man, I, you, I guess – both teams are happy to be playing the other. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 an opportunity for both teams to, you know, push the other one farther down and, and rise up to the, you know, the top half of the league, I'll say. And, you know, how many how many teams are going to make the NCAA tournament out of the Big Ten this year? I mean, what's it going to be? A lot of times we're talking eight, nine, maybe even ten. And I think this year, what are we talking, three or four? Four, maybe five. Uh, uh, there'd be five. It'd be five at least. Real? Really? Um, I who's think got, so. Uh, who's in fifth I place mean, right now? Like, where do you? I mean, get, you've I got mean, Michigan State. You've bubble. got the three automatics uh, with Purdue, Michigan, or Purdue, Mich- or Purdue, Wisconsin, and Illinois guaranteed. And right. I think Northwestern is 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 going to get but in. They're right. They're right there. And you're right. Like right today. I, I think they would be in. Michigan State probably today would be in. Would be real close, but would be in. But, but I mean, they got to have a good finish to the rest of their season. And the way the Big Ten season is going right now, Michigan State's not playing well, like on the road. Um, I mean, I, I don't think anyone's going to put all their money on Northwestern to finish the year out, you know, and 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 win more than they lose. Like it's just it's tough. Like. All the leagues are this way right now across the country. I mean, the Big 12 obviously is the best league in the country right now. And and those guys are beating each other. I mean, Kansas getting beat last night. That's another top five team getting beat by an unranked team. It's just um, – it's a different era of basketball that I don't – we're not used to. We're used to that top, you know, six teams in the polls every week winning their games, no matter home or away or who they're playing. And that's definitely not the case this season. No, it uh, it is certainly not. And uh, Indiana has not. There, see, not only has it not gone the way that the fans would like for it to go, it it's continued to sail like a a boat without a rudder. Uh, it, it's you just don't know which way the wind is going to you blow don't. this team, and, yeah. and don't you know, know who's going to show up. I said it to you a, a couple of games ago, Jim, and and that's I, I think I think I'm on a decent track and understanding how things went but i mean because this is exactly how i feel like how it went in my mind is you know like i've got some pretty good friends that are not i'll say the biggest xavier johnson fans and going into this season like i i went all in on xavier like i told him i'm like you guys are going to eat your words you know he's going to lead this team he's probably going to be the leading scorer even with malik because he's going to have the ball in his hands so much and he's going to control this team and he's his success is going to be a big factor in how good this team really is and and i believe that like i truly believe that i honestly think the coaches 
believe that. I mean, based on my conversations with them, I think I think that was what we all believed was how things were going to play out. A six-year senior, um, a guy who's played a lot of minutes and been very successful playing. And obviously, for whatever reasons, injuries and, and mishaps on the court and different things that have happened, that's not been the case. And so I didn't really – prepare for a backup plan in my head as to what we would do if that wasn't the case. And I also thought Gabe Cups would be um, more of a factor. I think he's been a solid, re- you know, replacement in there for Xavier, but I don't think he's played above his expectations at all. And so I- I'm not sure we had a plan for when we got smacked in the mouth and, you know, we got smacked in the mouth with Xavier's situation and you know, for whatever the reasons are with that. And, and I don't know that we have recovered from it. I don't know that we had a backup plan. And if we did, it hasn't executed the way we thought that was going to go. And so it's it's really just been a frustrating year all around. I mean, Indiana, you know, if you go back and look at it, Indiana has not won one single game that was was kind of a borderline game that you weren't sure they were going to win. Like going, I'm not counting the Army and Harvard and all those. Like those are ones you expect Indiana to win. You know, Kansas or North Carolina and those games, you know, Purdue, um, th- those games would be, you know, just big time. Obviously, we have no quad one wins. Like Those would be big time wins. Our best wins right now are Iowa and Ohio State. And those are home games that you probably should have expected to win. But I don't know. I'm just rambling. But, man, it, it's, Florida it's Gulf, gotten to Don't be. forget about that Florida Gulf Coast win, man. They beat yeah. FAU. <laughs> Yeah. No, not FAU, losing to Kennesaw State. Uh, well, no, Indiana did, but FGCU beat FAU. Uh, but then they turned around and lost to Kennesaw State. So it probably bumps it into uh, a quad three. Yeah, it like got them up into a quad three win. We've got more to talk about with the Todd Father here on this Tuesday. Be back with that and more. Brought to you by jo- MyJumpShot.com. If you got someone in your family that you know that you uh, are trying to get to the next level, fix that jump shot, man. Make them be Indiana kids again. Back with more right after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Formerly. Peacock game tonight. No, oh, yeah. Beauty. So. There, there will be uh, there will probably be people watching the game at uh, Hoosier Hanks East. I got. Have remember. you noticed that on days it. where they play on Peacock? That there's more. Oh, people absolutely. Oh, hell yeah, because they have Peacock. Yeah, maybe a couple more. Yeah, but it's just it's funny. If, like, if they were playing great, if they were playing great, and the, the place would be packed. But I mean, I, there's not, still people that are just. Uh, and I'm like, dude, just cancel it. It's pay it and then cancel. <laughs> right. Yeah. You I gotta set, but I gotta set my with. message. I gotta set, I know. I, oh boy. I I said that once on Twitter and boy, I got blasted by a bunch of them. And I'm like, it's a truth. You can write it off on your taxes and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like going, it's still money out of my pocket. People get so oh. mad about the Peacock stuff, but it's obvious, it's not going anywhere. They put freaking NFL playoff games on Peacock. Right, right. Oh, it's not going anywhere. It's NBC, man. I mean, it, it, anytime stuff like this changes, people just freak out about it. And then, you know, three years down the road, it'll become the norm and nobody will even think about it anymore. It'll just <laughs> be the way it is. And it's just as soon as it happens, everybody's Sheldon Cooper and they can't stand change. Uh, that's hilarious oh man all right who wins tonight i mean if we shoot if we shoot if we make eight threes i'll say we'll win if we if we make eight we hit threes, against them at home no I had to use my phone for the camera, so I can't pull up. Eight stuff. threes. If what, we make eight threes, threes and shoot seventy percent, eight threes and shoot seventy percent from the th- free throw line, we'll win. 
Now, the last game, they they blistered the free throw line. And Khalil Ware, wasn't he, at least in the first half, he was perfect, wasn't he, from every free throw? I, I believe, he, field, I believe every, he finished yeah, either the last game or the game before. One of those two he was, yeah. He finished the game eight for eight at the free throw line. Dang. If your I mean, center he, is the best free throw shooter, that's a problem. Malik Malik Renew was four of five, and Baco was three of four. That's uh, hey, two for he might also be our best three point shooter. That that's really and a problem. Yeah, that's also a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your best free three point shooter is is uh, Kalel Ware. All right, I go, think guys. percentage wise. No, yeah. yeah. Mbako is the best three point Yes, more yeah. to your door. This segment is brought to you by Reynolds Family Dentistry in Sellersburg. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Welcome back, Indiana Sports Beat Radio on this Tuesday, February 6th, and the Todd Father is in the house. Indiana takes on Ohio State tonight on the Peacock. If you're in the Bloomington area, you can head out to Hoosier Hanks East over on College Mall Road and watch the game. Stick around for after the game with the Todd father, Todd Leary, um, as he will break down the action for you and tell you what happened from the real standpoint. Serve wine uh, and cheese. There you, there you go. Lots of lots of lots of wine, lots of, with wine. That, uh, lots of cheese with the wine. I mean, yep. Yeah, yep. exactly. Uh, both teams are 13 and nine. Um, and th- this is a, 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 like I said, both of these teams, they've lost six out of seven Ohio state, four out of five for Indiana confidence has can't be very high. Now you got to go on the road. That makes it a little bit worse. Uh, you've got to you got to deal with the road that that adds a little bit to that. Whatever it's you know sleeping last night, if you, you, all that crap that, that that you go through as a player. But you, you guys, you probably were never in a situation like this where uh, because you played on such good teams. But what are these guys thinking? What do they have to do to get out of this funk and use this? Uh, this is an opportunity to steal. Uh, a Big Ten game and a road game at the same time. Yeah, it is. And, and I mean, so here's here's where I think the road kind of be misleading. And, and because the stats are so crazy about teams not being able to win on the road. But, but right now, Indiana is struggling. Indiana fans are great fans, very knowledgeable fans. We know we're knowledgeable fans. When things happen that we don't like on our home court, we tend to have – become booing fans recently so so honest i'll be honest with you i don't think it's that as much of a big of a deal being on the road as maybe it is in in some years because right now our home crowd boos when we miss free throws they boo when we go over whatever from the three-point line when we're losing to penn state and, and i'm not blaming the fans everybody's frustrated i get it i am in no way shape or form blaming the fans but but i'm just making the statement of the players now go on the road you know you're going to get booed the whole game the only way you shut those boos up is to make some shots and get a lead and dominate the game and you know what you're going to get in this environment and you know you, you couldn't the records are identical you you couldn't really mirror these teams any more uh than than what they are like they are very in very similar situations Um, They both had higher expectations than where they are right now, um, which means they've underachieved and are trying to get things turned around. And neither neither ship is heading in the right direction. (laughs) They're both they're both going down the toilet bowl. And so one of them is going to have to win. One of them is going to be in a better position tomorrow than they are today. And, you know, for Indiana to do that. you know, I, I, I'll, I'm just going to simplify it and, and say whatever the game plan is and whatever it is we are trying to accomplish, the stat line at the end of the day has to read, Indiana has to have made at least eight three-pointers. I don't care how many they shoot. And they have to shoot 70% from the free throw line. I don't care how many they shoot. Hopefully a lot. 
But if they get to those two stats, I think they have a pretty decent chance of winning the game. If they don't get to those two stats, I think they have a very, very small chance of winning the game. And, you know, that Coach Woodson doesn't make it um, – um, a focal point for the team in making three pointers. Um, so, you know, I'm going to say they're going to have to, I don't think they're going to run a lot of plays for three pointers. We don't have a ton of great three point shooters. So I'm not blaming him for not running that. But, but I would, I don't think you can win in today's basketball world, especially on the road in the Big Ten, without making a decent amount of three pointers. And three or four or five is not a decent amount. I think eight's got to be a minimum. And Indiana has not really decided. Uh, we, I mean, Mackenzie Abaco is, as you said, the best shooter on the team, and he is. But it's like the team doesn't have the dynamic of this is the best three-point shooter and this is another three-point shooter. I know the guys that can do it, but the offense is not always seems right. like it presents well, the opportunities it should. It's, it's real simple with this, Jim. Let's just you and I talk about it. Like, it, whether we agree or disagree, our top four are, are going to be the same, if even if they're not in the same order. But best shooters, I would, in my opinion, are McKenzie and Baco from the three-point line. McKenzie and Baco, Kalel Ware and Malik Renu probably are two and three for me in that case. And then, well, actually, we're going to talk best three-point shooters. Anthony Leal would be second. And then Kalel Ware and Malik Renew would be three and four. That's my three best or my four best percentage three point shooters. And two of those guys, I'm expecting to be inside the paint on 95% of our offensive possessions. So I don't have them in a position to be out shooting the ball, which puts Galloway in a position to shoot more from the outside. And um, it, it just it's not a formula right we don't have a recipe right now for we don't spread the floor out what we try to do i think you know i say this every game we just come down and we try to figure out a way to pound the ball inside 1995 version of college basketball and we're going to beat you pounding it on the inside and that's going to work a few games throughout the season but it's not going to work in the long run, you're not going to win games in 2024 NCAA college basketball by only pounding the ball inside. You got to knock shots down from the outside. Is this a game where somebody that uh, like Anthony Leo is going to have to have one of those games like he had a while back? Some somebody different is going to have to step up, and I'm not talking about Kalel Ware or Malik Renu. Uh, Mackenzie Abaco needs to have a good night, but somebody else has to step up because, like you said, while Renew and, and, and Ware are, are two of the best shooters, they're also the guys you need down in the paint because right. they're scoring at a very, very high rate there. Uh, although you, you still need the three point shooting, that needs to come from somebody else, yeah, and 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 so let's let me get past the three point shooting because I'll just harp on that all day long. But but let's let's put out an individual player and let's just say Xavier doesn't play again in this game. And, and let's say that Gabe Cups is running is you know playing twenty five to thirty minutes as a starting point guard of this team. He has to become more aggressive offensively. He has to be a threat to not only shoot the basketball from the outside but drive and penetrate into the lane and create stuff. He cannot just be a facilitator that catches the ball on the outside and reverses it from one side to the other. That's not what a point guard does. That's not what all good teams that have good point guards, that's not what their point guard does. And that's all he's doing for us right now. He's taking, what, two shots a game at most and 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 barely making anything, like, because he's not aggressive. The, the coaches have to get to him and say, hey, look, I don't care if you're 0 for 10, 0 for 15, I don't care. Take the pressure off of him from a making you've got to – shoot 70% perspective and say, you've got to be a threat to shoot the ball. You've got to be a threat to drive the ball and shoot little runners in the lane, which is what he's really good at creating inside, getting guys open. And when's the last time you saw him drive the ball inside the lane and make a crafty little pass inside or kick out for a three pointer. I can't even think of one all season long. And this guy's played a lot of minutes. I'm not blaming him. I'm not blaming the coaching staff. I I'm saying, I don't care why it hasn't happened in the past. 
it needs to start happening. And if he's not a threat, if he comes in today and shoots three times in this game, I don't care if he's three for three. We're getting, we're not going to win. If out of a 25 to 30 minute player on our floor isn't a bigger threat than to shoot the ball three times in this game, we're not going to win no matter what. I don't care what all the other stats are. Yeah, because for one, the defense just plays off, lays off of you, and which allows them to make it much more difficult for whomever else uh, you're, they're switching off to. And, 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 and you don't have the opportunity for the points and three beats two every time. I'm not saying that Ohio State is going to light it up, but we have seen way too many teams do that against Indiana, and I'm sure. not just talking about Big Ten teams. It happened in in the pre, in not the preseason, but the the non conference portion of the season. Whether it was Army or Kennesaw State or Florida Gulf Coast State, whomever it was, there were guys that didn't have their leading scores and still are able to light Indiana up on the perimeter. And at this stage of the game, this part of the season, I, I don't understand that with or without injuries to Xavier Johnson. Yeah, and, and you know, I don't expect that out of Ohio State, but maybe that's probably why it will happen because we don't expect it. They're not a great shooting yeah. team either. Um, but but when you look at it, like, I'm just focusing on Indiana and, and what Indiana has to do. You, you can't go in there hoping Ohio State has a bad game. You've got to expect them to have a really good game, and you've got to beat them on their home court expecting them to have a really good game. And And so with that being the case, you, you have to have five guys on the court. So I don't care if it's someone that comes in off the bench. The five players that are on the court have to be contributing something positively to your team, offensively and defensively. You can't have a guy that's just a filler. We can't fill any spots just to not make mistakes. And this team is not um, built or in a, in a position to um, score tons of points without having all five guys as contributors. They don't all have to have career nights. I'm not saying that. Please please don't think I'm saying we've got to have Anthony Hill come in and make eight three-pointers. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we have to have a, a good contribution from all five people that are on the court when they're on the court. And when you put guys in that are not threats, I, I mean, I honestly believe that's why Caleb Banks hasn't played very much recently. Because offensively, he's not really a threat. I think we've seen Anthony Walker's minutes go down because although I do kind of consider him a threat, um, offensively, other than offensive rebounding and getting loose balls inside, I, he's not really a threat to score. And right now, I, we, we put Gabe Cups in a terrible position in that Penn State game. And, and you know, someone not getting a hold of him and telling him, when they're pressuring you like that, drive right around them and go all the way to the basket. Like Penn State was not worried about him driving to the basket because they knew as soon as he crossed half court, he was going to stop and start running the offense. And that's a that's a bad spot to put a point guard in. Absolutely. And uh, Indiana, like you said, Indiana is not getting anything out of the point guard right now with the loss of Xavier Johnson uh, and, and Gabe Cups being put in a position that he's not quite ready for. But it, it's kind of up to him. He, he's going to have to step up. He he was good enough to get a scholarship to play at Indiana, and and, and I'm not trying to put pressure on him, but it's uh, it's three quarters of the way through the season, so you you're you're kind of you're you're no longer quite a freshman. You're a freshman and a half, and you just got to step up and do some things, and that is going to be on him to push that issue. Well, and here's the hard part. Like, he's doing what they're asking him to do. Like, he's running and controlling the offense and doing all that. Like, he's he's not making mistakes. Like, he's doing kind of what they're asking him to do. Here, Here's where I'm in agreement with you. Here's what's got to happen. He's got to say, okay, well, we're not – we don't run plays for me or whatever it is. If they're going to pressure me like that. The only way for me to relieve the pressure from another guard like that is to be a threat to drive the ball all the way in the lane. So – in my opinion, Gabe Cups is going to have to take some risks. He's going to have to risk, you know, he, he's going to roll the dice and drive into the lane and pull up and, and shoot a couple shots and make them or drive into the lane and get guys to commit to him and drop the ball off for some easy baskets inside. No coach is ever going to be upset with that. Even though that's not the play, that's not what we're running. That's not what we're supposed to run. 
But but Gabe Kipps is going to have to take some gambles. He's going to have to roll the dice on himself, bet on himself, and go in there and try to make some plays happen. I am, and you haven't heard me one time say shoot nine three pointers. I would love for him to be a threat shooting the three point line, but right now, what what we really need him to do is to take some gambles and drive and penetrate with that ball, and and make some things happen. And I think our offense changes dramatically. If we have a guard that's doing that, we all expected that guard to be Xavier for a multitude of reasons. That's not been the case this season. So whoever is in there at that position needs to create some stuff, not only for themselves on their own, but for other players, not just be a ball facilitator, getting the ball moving around the outside. Uh, Xavier Johnson, as we said, not, uh, playing for Indiana, so that leaves them shorthanded, and they were already shorthanded at the guard position. Uh, ironically, if I asked you who Indiana has beaten the most all time, the easy guess is the, uh, Northwestern, and that's correct. But the second, the program that is second that they have the most wins over uh, was a little surprising to me, and actually it's a two-way tie. Um, but one of the teams is Ohio State. The other yeah, one is Michigan. Uh, and I'm like, damn. And I'm like, they still lead the series uh, substantially. And I'm like, it, it's it's crazy. But And Indiana beat this team already once this year. Does that give them any kind of advantage? Or has that been lost with, with, with the time between then and now? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit lost. I, I, I would say uh, they they kind of know, I guess, the recipe for – for what they need to do, what they are going to be able to do um, and take advantage of against Ohio State a little bit. I, so I'll, I'll say maybe a little bit with that. But, I mean, let's take the names off the jerseys and let's just be straight-up college basketball fans from Arkansas that are not tied to Indiana or Ohio State in any way. And if you're just looking at these two teams on paper and you look at who they've beaten and their stats and their records and everything like that, I think the average – college basketball fan would look at this and say, well, that team's going to win when they're at home. And when they go to the other place, that team's going to win when they're at home. And and that's, that's truly exactly the way this game looks like it should play out. And if Indiana doesn't do something better than what they have been doing, that is exactly how it's going to play out. They're going to go in there and get beat unless they do something better than what they have been doing in the past. And in my humble opinion, uh, that is shooting the basketball. And, and yes, I'm simplifying it to that. They can miss switches. They can miss how they handle rotations and how they don't handle ball screens and all that. All they want is to get out-rebounded. If they shoot the ball better, they're going to have a chance to win. That's a, Penn State didn't play great against Indiana. You know what they did great? They made a bunch of tough shots. They made, they made three-pointers with – and you heard the announcers even say it. You couldn't guard it any better than that. That's just a great shot. That happened numerous times in that game. They didn't play great. They shot the ball great. End of story. I, I think Indiana, I don't think Indiana has to shoot it great. I think they have to shoot it better than they have in order to win yeah. at Ohio State. And they've got to be a little bit better with the basketball, a 13 to 6 turnover margin in the last game, but a bigger margin was points off the bench. Uh, and that was a staggering. 18 to 3 differential. Indiana is getting nothing from the bench. Caleb Banks is just disappeared. Uh, you mentioned Walker, his minutes have gone down. He played five minutes in the last game. CJ Gunn did uh play 11 minutes and hit his uh and hit one shot and his his only free throw. So he contributed in that in that span, but that's it. And then you've got Gabe Cups, who we talked about who provided his normal two points, you're getting zip from your point guard and then you're getting zip from your bench. It's really difficult to beat teams who are getting contributions from, from a lot of guys. Yeah, well, and, you know, it, it's not – this is no secret formula. Like, it, if you have a point guard that's not scoring any points or really even taking any shots, he has to have some other staggering statistic like 16 assists in a game or, you know, double digit assists. He has to be creating something for someone else. Otherwise, all he is 
is a ball facilitator. He's not a point guard. He is reversing the ball back out to him, and he's throwing it to the to another guy, who who in turn is probably just throwing it to another guy. Like he's just facilitating ball movement, as opposed to being a point guard that's actually creating things for your team. And that's all the, all the teams that are really good. I don't care if their best player on their team is, is a is the center. I don't care. All the teams that are good have a good guard. Like they have a good in college basketball, they have a good guard, and that guard doesn't necessarily have to be the leading scorer or the best shooter, but he has to be good, and he has to be able to create things for other people and get the ball where it needs to go and drive and make shots when he needs to make shots. And and right now that position is lacking at Indiana. Uh, it certainly is. Uh, looking forward to getting out to Hoosier Hanks tonight because I'm looking forward to getting the Jimbo special, baby. Yes, sir. Uh, it is the best. I will guarantee you it is the best thin crust pizza definitely in Bloomington without question, and especially if you get the Jimbo special. Pepperoni, sausage, mushroom, onions, and banana peppers. Though that That's my pizza. That's my go-to. What What is yours? Uh, all of that would be great, minus the peppers. Like I'm not a not a banana pepper guy of any oh, sort. Man. I probably would eliminate the mushrooms, but I'd eat them if they were on there. So I'm with you. But I will say, like I, I'm a pizza nut. Like I I eat pizza a lot, and I will tell you <laughs> that thin crust pizza that they have is is legit. It's really really good. The garlic butter crust is crazy yeah, good. Come out and so join good. us tonight. We'll be out there uh, after the game with Todd Leary, of course. Indiana takes on Ohio State on Peacock, and you can watch that game at Hoosier Hanks East if uh, you're in the Bloomington area and want to come out. If you do, maybe I'll bring some uh, some swag to throw out. But uh, looking forward to that. Todd, uh, thank you, sir, and looking forward to tonight. See you in a bit. Absolutely. Todd Leary brought to you by MyJumpShot.com. For those that have kids, no kids, no anybody that wants to get to the next level. Maybe it's you. You're playing in a rec league. It doesn't no, matter. You, you're you going to the fantasy camp. Fix that. You can still fix that yeah. shot, baby. You can be the guy. Yeah. How would you like to go into the next fantasy camp and after having sucked the last time and now lighting it up? They're like, who's this guy? That's what happens with MyJumpShot.com. We're back with more Indiana Sports Beat Radio after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. In the market. Uh, that's cool. that's easy to have fun with. <laughs> I swear. Yeah. That's, it's it's so funny. Easy. I've had a couple of people reach out to me that were people that went to the fantasy camp that want me to work with them. They're grown-ass adults. Oh, that's it. great. <laughs> I Steve, love it. If you hadn't have mentioned that, I, I wouldn't have thought of that. But uh, but that does w- with it being on Indiana Rivals. I'm like, going, oh, there's that. That'll catch. Well, th- but think about guys. this. Like this is this is my point in that is if you're if you're an adult and you've got kids, like me teaching you what to do helps you teach your kid what to do. Like that's that's my point in a lot of it is I, I can help the parents if people just go ask their kid right now about shooting they are going to be shocked at the answer they get i'm I, that's a fact you, you know someone who plays in those that i know that still plays in those <laughs> the, the, MC. oh yeah the guy They're mr guy. mr 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 yeah the initials mr the owns that, yes yeah 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 i met him so, the other day. Uh, what's his name oh uh, i know i but yeah, well, yeah. But I just I'm thought not, of that. Oh, I'm like, sorry. Oh, am I not supposed to say that? I, sorry, I got to mention that to him. I go, hey man, uh, <laughs> there you go. All right, I'll see you. I, I, all right, buddy, have a good one. I'll talk to you later. See you guys. See you, bud. Thank you. All right, I guess no Mike Nizelik. I didn't hear from him today, but oh well. We we'll only have about ten minutes here ish. I reposted Mason Williams's post on a story he did, and it just simply says, 
uh, on mine was Indiana basketball travels to Ohio State, two teams at a crossroads with unhappy fan bases. Which team comes through this, tonight? The winner of NIT hopes alive, I guess, right? Is that, is that what's going on at this point? <laughs> that is actually correct, as sad as it is to say. You are correct, sir. It is sad right there. See, then comes the dilemma, like, as a fan, like, you obviously would like to see your team play more basketball, but, like, do you really want to watch them play the NIT? I mean, it's, it's, it's you know. It's like if you're a blue blood in football and you're playing in like the Pop Tarts Bowl, like, do you really want to see that if you're Alabama, that kind of thing? I'm not exactly. trying to say Indiana is Alabama, but no, I, I'm telling you right now, when I went to the Sugar Bowl several years back when they played Louisville, they were so pissed off. They, they're like, uh, you know, who cares about Louisville? Louisville ended up kicking their ass. Um, and that was Florida. And then Alabama did the same thing, I think, in the uh, back in '91 when they played right, Louisville. In the accidentally, <laughs> you buy Bubba's 33 in Clarksville and Evansville pizza, burgers, beer. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Welcome back, Indiana Sports Beat Radio here on this Tuesday. It's game day for Indiana. Game day for a lot of people. Uh, there are a lot of games that are uh, being played tonight. Tonight's the night um, in the Big Ten. Oh, man, I lost my, uh, my schedule. But uh, here we go. Indiana plays Ohio State. You already know that. I'm trying to buy time as I quickly slide through and get to uh, the only other game in the Big Ten. Ah! Oh, that was yesterday. You know about Purdue beating Wisconsin. That was last Sunday. Nebraska loses in overtime at Illinois. Oh, Tommy Naga. 31 points. Nebraska has a guard from Japan who put up 31 points. He would never have been recruited to Indiana, though. Um, there were no games on Monday. And tonight's schedule. Rutgers is at Maryland. That's on the BTN. Um, I cannot see Maryland getting beat at home by Rutgers, but there's always surprises. Michigan State, or, then you have Indiana at Ohio State at seven on the Peacock. Peacock! And then following that, also on Peacock, the Spartans, they travel to Minnesota. That's going to be an interesting game. Minnesota has been tough enough that playing on the road at Minnesota is probably not going to be easy. This is going to be, for Michigan State, this is going to be a, a, uh, a litmus test. Where are they? If they win this game, then they take that step up into being one of the teams from the Big Ten that will make the big dance, without question. And, and, and Michigan State, they've struggled. But They've maintained their, their selves. They've maintained uh, their poise. And they find themselves in the upper half of the Big Ten standings. And that is what they will need to keep doing to hit the NCAA tournament. Not that they're going to miss, but they were not exactly um, 
lighting things up, as you'd say, early on. But as many Tom Izzo teams have done, they just get better. They get better with age, and they have definitely done that. Looking at the Big Ten Conference standings, Purdue, of course, at the top. It's going to be hard. Illinois has one shot. They play Purdue at home in a few games. They have to win that game, and then it's going to be a very interesting race because that would give them the opportunity to tie Purdue. Not only that, Wisconsin would be there with the same number of losses, but Purdue probably has the tiebreaker over them with the win. Todd asked, you know, who was going to make the NCAA besides uh, those three? Well, Northwestern, I, they're 11 and 1 at home. They're 15 and 7 overall. They're going to win, uh, you know, at least four more games, maybe 20. Uh, I don't, I'd have to look at their schedule, but they're going to make it. I think Michigan State, because we know what they end up doing, I think they end up making it. And then you have to look at the the last possible team from the Big Ten is going to be Nebraska. And what if Nebraska makes the NCAA tournament, which they very probably will not, they're a better team in Indiana, although in conference play, they're they're at the Mendoza line. They're six and six. But they're 16 and seven overall, 14 to one at home. Not good on the road, one and six. But Nebraska can do enough, I think, to uh get to the NCAA. Uh Probably can't find them quick enough on on Ken Palm just to get an idea where they are. But um, I know that the Big Ten has got three teams, Rutgers, Indiana, Michigan. They're all down 99, 100, 101. I mean, if you play at Indiana and get a win, it's like a quad three win now. Can you – I cannot even imagine saying that much less it being true, but that's that's the fact, Jack. Um, looking up through the Ken Palm as I'm trying to see some teams that might stick, stick out um, from the Big Ten especially. I was looking for Nebraska to see where they are, but um, it's hard. There's Northwestern. Northwestern's 50 in Ken Palm. North Nebraska, 46 in Ken Palm. You're in. Just – you know, just do your thing on the way for the rest of the season. They can go 500 the rest of the season. And I think that even I said that a, a 500 record this year in the Big Ten would not get you in. That depends on who you are. If Nebraska has a 500 record this year, I still think they get in. Um And looking at the remainder of their schedule, they go to Northwestern tomorrow. I'm gonna that's gonna I'm gonna hang an L on them for that. But then they have back to back home games against Michigan, Penn State, before traveling to Indiana. They get Minnesota at home. They've got to go to Ohio State. They get Rutgers at home, and they end the year at Michigan. So. That could be a win. The Rutgers game, a win. Nebraska could should win at Ohio State. There's three wins. They get Minnesota at home. That's going to be a fourth win. Penn State at home. Michigan at home. Um, I'm going to give them six more wins on the season, in, in my opinion, and what I think that they'll do. So I, I think Nebraska makes the NCAA tournament. I think they win 22 games this year. How about that? Man, it was been another fun show. I cannot thank everybody enough, as always, for joining us, no matter where you are, how you're listening, 
all the great folks on uh, ESPN 97.7, The Ref. Stay tuned for uh, everything they've got coming up today, the call-in show, and uh, later on this evening. 1380, The Fan, 104.9 as well. They're going to have the Super Bowl on this weekend, so make sure you keep it tuned in to there. And just keep it there, locked on for Caleb and Kenny in the morning, and then the Sports Rush immediately following Indiana Sports Beat Radio on The Fan. And then, of course, WJOB, 1230 AM, 104.7, The Voice of the Region in Chicago land up uh, in the – Northwest corner of the state. We appreciate each and everybody. And if you're on YouTube, listening on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button, please. And thank you. We're grateful for everybody on the Andy Moore Honda hotline. What do you need to see tonight? Uh, Indiana Sports Connection effort. Effort and three-point defense and three-point shooting. There's my opinion on that. Thanks a lot for the question. Great to see you, Indiana Sports Connection. and. Big thanks to uh, John, the producer, as always, for keeping us between the white lines. Thanks to uh, Mike DeCourcy and the Todd Father. And don't forget, tonight, after the game with Todd Leary from Hoosier Hanks East, come out and uh, watch the game with us. I'll be out there. Until then, I'm Jim Coyle. I will see you on the radio. Thanks for listening to Indiana Sports Beat Radio. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page for more clips and team coverage of Indiana basketball, football, and more. You can also find full episodes and tons of other content on thehoosier.com. We'll see you next time for another edition of Indiana Sports Beat Radio.